guys are talking. Brush two, 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 two guys. Two guys are talking. Brush two guys are talking. Brush two, two guys are guys are talking. Brush, 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 two guys. And now, get ready for the Two Guys Talking Rush podcast with your hosts, John Kane and Dan Buxman. Hey folks, this is John Kane with Two Guys Talking Rush, show number 12. I'm here with my buddy, Dan Buxman. Dan, John. how are you? I'm okay. Uh, this is what always we, the We should just I, stare at each other and just say nothing. Yeah, two guys staring at each other. That'll yeah. Be the, yeah, that's the spinoff show. That's exciting. Two guys talking rush. Yeah, definitely. Who doesn't Who doesn't want to see that? It's even better as a podcast with, with no pictures. Just tumbleweeds. Know, so just dead air for like an hour and a half. I would love it's to fine. do that. It's yeah, fine. Yeah. It's the John Cage show. <laughs> How you been, man? been good uh happy it's friday and uh, oh and uh me and my whole family went and got tested for covid and we are all negative so not only uh was it a good week and i'm doing well but we're all in good health good uh yeah and we're gonna do it every week just because why not i'm very much about like everyone should be wearing masks everyone should be getting tested and i'm trying to just live my values you know yeah, cool. Yeah, I got tested last week, and uh, yeah, nothing, no, no COVID. Uh, wash your hands, Excellent. folks. Uh, yep. Don't touch doorknobs. I remember my grandmother would always be like, "Get your hands off the." We'd go down, we'd go down to Filene's basement in downtown Boston, Boston, right. the weekends, and I'd touch the banister. Get your hands off the banister, and I'll tell you, not if, if she was alive now. It. Yeah, that that did did it. Trick. Exactly. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I had uh, I had older relatives like that too, where they oh. had to say something once and it was committed to memory for the rest of my life to this very day so um yeah so no i feel it no the the thing that's been the hardest for me in all this has been not touching my face yeah i don't know if you remember like when that guideline came out initially they were like whatever you do don't touch your face yeah as soon as they said that i'm you know i'm just like touching touching my face face. Yeah. yeah and i had no idea that apparently I love to touch my face because I cannot yeah. stop. My yeah. biggest, my biggest problem was touching other people's faces, like people I don't well, really yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, li- I like doing that. Just go walking. Well, you were to trying somebody. to, you were trying to reenact the end of uh, Lionel Richie's "Hello" video. The clay mold, the the clay yes, sculpture. Exactly. Yeah, this yeah. is how I see you. Yes, oh, yeah. Lionel Richie, what a yeah. legend! Two yes. guys. Two guys talking Lionel Richie. Talking Richie. Two G L R. Talking Richie. Well, yeah. hey guys, you know this is what you get with a uh, with a podcast with no funding. Uh, sorry. A bunch of- <laughs> yeah. um, well, I you know it's fall time here. It's 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 we're getting some beautiful fall days, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, I've been listening to my. I've been walking more. I've been doing about three miles a day because I need to lose weight. Nice. Yeah, I need to do it, and um, I'm I'm really gonna try to change my diet and eat, eat better and uh you know no chinese food at 12 at midnight and then sleepy time yeah, yeah. that's bad um i was I, I know yeah. i wasn't doing that anyway but uh you know uh well past seven o'clock i haven't been eating past six or seven o'clock so i go to bed starving um like usually i'd have like a bowl of cereal or something you know but no right I've, yeah. I've stopped all that uh and then just every day uh incorporating 30 to minutes to an hour of walking every day um uh so i've been doing that for about uh i don't know nine days now and you're going like the woods or I, yeah we've done mixed between woods i'll go with the family in the woods and then i'll do you know kind of uh, around the neighborhoods where i live and uh you know i i feel better but i also feel like shit because when i first started i'm like oh my god i am so out of shape like you never know how much if you don't do anything right it's not that i don't do anything i do stuff but if you don't move your body at a certain right. age and then you start moving your body whoa you know yeah uh, oh yeah i i hear you absolutely terrible 
Yeah. Well, if people are just tuning in now, they're probably thinking like, what the hell's going on? Anyway, folks, this is Two Guys Talking Rush podcast, <laughs> episode 12. We've made it to episode 12. Holy yeah, cow. It's, we're off to the races, man. I, Who knows? We might even yeah. make it to 13. Like I've said before, both Dan and I have quit the show and come back to the show. Lawyers, agents, our egos are in the way. You know, Dan has one track. I have another track. We don't work well together, but here we are. We love, we love Rush. And I'm just being, I'm being very uh, funny about all that. Dan and I are, oh, no. are good friends and, and yes. just, we, we just need to have a little jokey, jokey time on the show. Uh, yes, it's important. It, it is important. It does. Yeah. It does. It does matter. Um, but anyway, yes, we've made it to, to episode 12. Uh, we've crawled, up, ca- crawled our way out of the basement, out of the gutter to, to, to elevate to the podcast, uh, 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 you know, uh, the, the, the throne, the p- podcast throne in yes. the sky. Yeah. Here we are, Dan. We're kings. In, in an ivory tower, looking down with disdain. <laughs> um, yes, exactly. Yes, yeah, on all other podcasts. Demonically. To, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. To, I don't know, to do more shows. I guess that's our <laughs> Yeah, what's that's what, our what demonic. Are we, what are we plot. getting? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's more. Yeah, just more of this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, so this is this is episode 12. It's uh, what I've given it a, f- a very fancy uh, title. It's called The Watchmaker Lives On, A New Legacy of Clockwork Angels. And the guest of our show is Kevin J. Author, sci-fi writer Kevin J. Anderson. Wow, I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah. Um, we um, we also want to thank uh, our, our previous guests uh, on episode 11. Why? Why not? T- Tim Starachi, Rocky Kuner, and Billy Alexander. What a talented and nice group of yeah. musicians. Um, just great music. Listen to Why? Why not? Uh, as much as you can, and uh, we really had a good time. Uh, yeah, that was a really good on. show. I Wasn't it? Really enjoyed having those guys on. Yeah. Yeah. Gals. Excuse me. Exactly. Guys, and, guys gals. and gals. Yeah. Well, Rocky's just amazing, and uh, yeah. uh, Kevin J. Anderson is amazing too. Um, he's uh, an American science fiction author uh, who's published over 140 books, over 50 of which have been on the U.S. and international bestseller list, and he has more than 23 million books in print worldwide. Wow. Rush fans will know his work. In 2012, Anderson penned a novelization of Clockwork Angels. We are really glad to have him on the show. Uh, you can hear our podcast on TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, and Simplecast, and others. Uh, we're getting lots of downloads. Uh, we have a lot of unique listeners now, and our fan base keeps growing, which, which is Great. wonderful. Yeah. Uh, a big shout out to RushRadio.org. And I do want to mention this to folks and plant this seed that Dan and I will be going live with Two Guys Talking Rush once a month at least. Uh, and we will be live on uh, RushRadio.org uh, Facebook page and Rush is a Band facebook page and uh we'll just be rolling with the show there and we'll let people know definitely friend us on facebook uh and that way you can join in the conversation live uh and uh there's more to come on that uh yeah and again a shout out to why why not for their music in the intro we really appreciate that Mm -hmm. uh any any questions from fans for the show or show ideas uh we'd love to hear your feedback uh negative or positive you want to just bitch and moan about your life, you know, send us, we'll listen. We yeah. could be, a, we could be a couple of therapists. We can help people. Mm-hmm. I don't no mind. Problem. Also, also, if people have hyper specific little detailed questions about things that appear in the music or that are somehow related to the music, mm. uh, like we got one question about, you know, what is that little thing on the camera eye right. at, uh, at like the eight and a half minute mark or something like that. Yep. Uh, those sorts of little details. I love that. I know. And it's, so if anyone's out there thinking like, well, you know, I've got a question for these guys, but maybe it's too trivial and it's not really like that. No, we want that. We want that very badly. Uh, we want the most committed, fanatical Rush fans who sit there hyper-analyzing every little bit of it. We we want you. We accept you. You are one of us. So please send in your questions about, you know, what type of pick Alex uses, uh, you know, what what size jeans Getty wears, you know, any of that. Just, you know, we we want it. Please. 
we beg I, of you. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, it's, it's good interaction with our fan base and, um, you know, we'll do the research for you. You know, we'll dig, yeah. we'll dig deep and we'll find out and uh, we'll talk about it. Um, so uh, you can reach us at two guys talking Russia at gmail.com. You can visit us at our website, www.twoguystalkingrush.com. Um, and our Facebook page is facebook.com slash two guys talking rush. We're on Twitter and that's twitter.com slash two, the number two guys talk rush. And that's at Twitter. And please subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel where you can see Dan and I uh, in the uh, physical form. Uh, yes. where we, we record these, uh, these podcasts uh, uh, in, in the video format. Um, so, oh, yeah, go ahead. Dan. And say speaking something? of um, like little details, yeah. uh, if you want to email us at two guys talking rush, it's TWO guys talking rush. Thank you. Yes. So if some of you have been doing the number two, and it's bouncing back to you. That's why it's TWO. And also the website is the same thing. Yes. But the, but the Twitter handle is the number two. Number two, exactly. Thank Got all know. that? Okay. Yeah, right. um, okay. Okay, good. Well, thank you, Dan. And uh, uh, in, as we do in each podcast, we talk a little bit about uh, uh, Rush and the history of Rush uh, as, it, as it relates to the week in which we're talking about rush so this week in rush history and i'll, I'll rip through this in 74 rush play the roxy theater in northampton pennsylvania on the rush tour in 77 they played winterland in san francisco california on the a farewell to kings tour uh, the mighty winterland venue uh, in 89 alex lifeson was in the studio to record his parts for the rock aid armenia the earthquake album benefit album in 2004, Rush played the Fest Hall in Frankfurt, Germany on the 30th anniversary tour, later released on our 30, uh, 30th anniversary world tour. Um, good night, Frankfurt. You know, you hear that. Uh, oh, wow, that was, that was today? This was the, uh, uh, the 2004, this week was the anniversary of that. Wow. Um, yeah. Uh, 2012, uh, Rush played the Target Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota on the Clockwork Angel Store. Issue four of the comic book Revival was published, featuring a character wearing an original logo Rush shirt, Rush t-shirt. In 2013, the horror comedy film Knights of Badastum premiered about live action role players whose final goal is to reach the temple of Syrinx. Uh, some uh, continuing on with some Rush news. <laughs> the latest edition of Prog Magazine, issue 113, includes a cover feature on the greatest Prog musicians of all time. Who do you think is included? The feature reveals the results of their extensive poll where they asked readers to vote on their favorite progressive rock musicians. The top 200 artists were included in the final list with write-ups for the top 100. All three members of Rush made it. Uh, made the top 10, including Alex at number nine, Getty at four, and Neil Peart in the number one spot. The issue includes one-page write-ups for Alex and Getty and a six-page profile for Neil. Right on. Um, Rightly so. I know. Yeah. I was going to say, they're totally worthy of that. Uh, Grapes for Humanity will be hosting a Save Hospitality Online fine wine auction in support of the hospitality industry beginning this coming Monday or Monday, September 28th through uh, October 7th at um, let's see, let's see, September 28th through Wednesday, October 7th via Waddington's Auctioneers and Appraiser. The auction will feature over 300 lots of exceptional wines and winery tours, as well as two signed guitars donated by Getty Lee and Alex Lifeson. They love wine. They love the vino. Do you drink yes. wine, Dan? Do you drink, are you a wine drinker? Uh, every so often I will have a glass of cardio protective red wine. Oh. Uh, but uh, I'm not a big drinker, to be honest yeah, with yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, it's just, I don't know. It just never Medium. really stuck Medium. for me. Yeah, um, but yeah, nice, nice glass of wine. That's nothing wrong with that. Every yeah, so often, yeah. even even Ted Nugent recently said that he started having a little bit of wine every now and then. Yeah, uh, I think as you get to be older, uh, if you didn't drink before, you, it's it can work for you if it's yeah. every, if moderation and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, drinking like the way most people drink, it yeah. just kind of makes me nauseous and I have to go to sleep. So yeah, yeah. not yeah. for me. 
Yeah, I understand. Yeah, same here. I'm not a big drinker, but yeah, I think I'm going to start drinking a little bit more wine. Uh, live, the live event community is a resource and voice for Canadian live event workers who have lost their livelihood due to COVID-19, shutting down events worldwide. Uh, this is uh, uh, an organization sponsoring at uh, hashtag light up live event, uh, where they're asking technicians, suppliers, and venues across the country to light the night red, raising awareness for an industry that is still dark as a direct result of COVID-19. Russia's Getty Lee is lending his voice to the effort and posted a video message to social media uh, earlier this week, urging everyone to support the effort. effort. So hashtag light up live and the organization is live event community. Um, uh, very interesting. There's more, you're hearing more and more uh, come out about the live event industry, how it's suffering. And I'm glad that artists are now jumping on board to help support yeah. these production crews very important to do that um and uh, crew nation is another one here in the in in um, uh, the u.s uh russia's moving pictures makes rolling stone magazine's revamped list of the 500 greatest albums of all time since when do rolling stone suddenly acknowledge uh our favorite band because they've just been like constantly disrespected by that institution for uh, god Rush, knows how yeah, long but they made the they made rolling stone cover the cover rolling stone in the past 10 years or so did wasn't there i think i have a copy yeah but you know i mean i got i mean honestly there's part of me that's like oh now suddenly it's okay yeah like you completely disrespected these guys for 30 years and, and then suddenly it's like none of that happened it's like no you you were horrible to them for their well, entire career and just because you've got some younger writers suddenly writing for you recently yeah. doesn't change that. You know, they got Led Zeppelin wrong. They got Neil Young wrong. They, they're, yeah, I don't know. A I history, don't know if you ever... There's a history of the sort of thing. I mean, that's the thing with Rolling Stone. Yeah. And, you know, it goes right down to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, induction, uh, oh. having R Rush even be acknowledged. There was, a, I think there was a lot of booing at that as well. Because when really? Yan, when, yeah, well, when Yan Wenner got up, I think there was some, there's a lot of hostility with that organization and politics that are involved with the rock and roll hall of fame. Uh, oh, for sure. uh, yeah, for sure. yeah. But having rush not be acknowledged for so long was, was a, uh, was a thing. I mean, there's so many worthy bands that should be in there. I, you know, I don't know how to figure them. Figure I, out I don't know. I think, I think, uh, you know, and I may get in trouble for this, uh, but I think, you know, Rolling Stone, and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and that sort of thing are, they're, to, to my mind, are sort of the product of people who are very much about like music up to about 1971. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And like, like it all stopped with Carol King's Tapestry album. <laughs> like no other music was made after that. Yeah. And, um, you know, I mean, the, I, you know, we, you and I know people yeah. who their uh, their taste and everything was really formulated in the 60s. Uh, you know, they went they went to Woodstock. This was a big thing for them. Yeah. And in the 70s, when the next wave started coming in, I could see how a lot of those people would see that as like, you know, this thing that's taking away what we love and is calling us like old farts and that kind of thing. So I can actually, I can understand some of the hostility. I and mean, that happened to me. Yeah. Also, you know, when I was part of like certain music scenes when I was young and then something new would come along and I didn't understand it and I felt threatened by it and that yeah. sort of thing. So I, I feel like they may be in that kind of yeah. thing. And, you know, and, and Rush just, I, I know for a fact that at the time when they came out, were just hated, 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 hated. Yeah. Uh, well, no one, by, can, no one understood them. You know, they, yeah, no, no one, yeah. no one understood Zeppelin. I mean, and granted Zeppelin played live, played v poorly live. I mean, they just were a very sloppy band, you know, but you know, there's smatterings of good journalism in, in early Rolling Stone. I mean, I'm one of my favorite rock writers is Cameron Crowe. Uh, right. And I love his early uh, efforts in journalism. And of course, Hunter S. Thompson and, uh, sure. uh, and Lester Bangs. I'm not sure. I think maybe Lester had a short stint at Rolling Stone before he was at Cream. I'm not entirely sure. Oh, I don't know. At it. Yeah. But no, I mean, you know, early Rolling Stone, uh, when it was made out of just newspaper, yes. um, uh, you know, it's, I have a whole stack of them. I, I, I love, I, I collect them, as much, you know, when I get them cheap. And um, 
they're fun now to look back on. But you're right. There's a lot. There was a lot of misunderstanding of uh, of and, and a lot of um, alienation of uh, of in very judgmental uh, journalism uh, with certain bands for whatever yeah. reason. I don't know what it was. I mean, you know, you know, why wouldn't why wouldn't someone like Rush when they first heard them? I mean, you know, they sound like Led Zeppelin. You know, you got a you got an organization like Rolling Stone who didn't like Led Zeppelin to begin with. And then, Why is that lady singing so high? <laughs> or, yeah. You know, I'm sure a, co a couple of people probably asked that too. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's To me, it just, it seems like the that same syndrome of like, you know, we got in on this thing early on, this is our thing, and then everyone else came in and now it sucks. Yeah. I mean, I know you've seen that syndrome in oh, action, yeah. Yeah. like over and over and over again. It's very human, I think. Yeah. I also, uh, you know, I'm not going to lie. I bought Rolling Stone all the time too, and sure. uh, I, you know, and I would sit there and I'd be like, "How can you say this? Ah, that's <laughs> terrible!" And then I would buy the next issue. So yeah. I, I have a part to play in all this too. I'm not yeah. going to lie. Yeah, totally. No, I totally get it. Well, um, you can find uh, all the details I just uh, read uh, to you on RussiasABand.com. They have a wonderful uh, news section there. And uh, that site is run by our friend uh, and legendary Rush fan, Ed Stinger. He's a friend of the band and uh, has, has basically started Rush as a band uh, very early on. That's, that site has been around for a long time. Yeah. He's, a, he's a pioneer uh, in the, in, in the, within the Rush fandom, uh, internet fandom. Uh, so thank you, Ed Stinger, for keeping it alive. Yeah. Um, well, uh, again, the show is, uh, again, called The Watchmaker Lives On, A New Legacy of Clockwork Angels. Our guest is Kevin J. Anderson. Um, you know, one of the things uh, we do from time to time is we do get into some songs. Uh, and I asked Dan, uh, since this show is about Clockwork Angels, uh, what if you were to pick two songs off the album, which songs those would be? And um, we've highlighted some songs. That we've mentioned The Garden in previous episodes. That That is a personal favorite of mine yeah. uh, but I picked two new ones today and um, Dan you chose uh, Be You To Be and Halo Effect uh, right. as uh, the two favorites for you out of the out of the Clockwork Angels album why why yeah. those two what was it about those two that you love so much musically they just always jumped out at me when I would listen to it um, yeah. the songs that you picked also yeah. Did, but we'll, you know, we'll get to that in a minute. Sure. Um, I mean, I just, I remember the first time I heard BU2B, I was, I was like, my God, you know, that's, that is a heavy riff that yeah. like, I had kind of given up on them writing stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I remembered like Vapor Trails was a very heavy album. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, Snakes and Arrows was a little less heavy and so i just assumed they were probably going to go in that direction and it would get a little less heavy as time went on and instead they came out with this thing that was like whoa my god um yeah. but uh you know i mean everything about it you know from the arrangement to the lyrics to everything uh it, it just jumped right out at me the first time i heard it um you want to listen you want to listen you, you want to listen oh, okay, to yeah, a little yeah. bit of bu2b and then we can get to halo effect right after Sure. All right, let's do that. So let's listen to a little bit of BU to be, and then we'll get into your other pick, uh, Halo Effect. And Very 
heavy tune. Oh yeah. yeah. Like again, I was, I was surprised the first time I heard it. Yeah. And, um, what about halo effect? What was it about halo effect that you, halo, yeah. Halo effect is different. Um, cause uh, it was, it's funny. Uh, cause you know, every so often when we get into the subject of the eighties albums, like the keyboard stuff, I tend to give it a little bit of short shrift. Uh, but there's stuff on Halo Effect that reminded me very much of Power Windows, uh, at least like melodically and in terms, of, you know, in terms of the arrangement and that sort of thing. And uh, the guitar solo specifically sounded to me like, oh, the, that sounds like an outtake from uh, Marathon from Power Windows. Interesting. Uh, and it's even in like the same. It's in like a seven-four time signature or something like. Like it, it, it's not an album. I mean, it's not as Power Windows is not an album I would have expected them to revisit on this album. Yeah. You know, like those are th those are two very competing visions of what Rush is. Mm -hmm. uh, but to them, it's like, no, this is part of the whole thing. And uh, this is just as much a Rush album as Power Windows. And, you know, too bad if, uh, you know, you compartmentalize them differently. It's all the same thing to us, and yeah. uh, I respect that a lot. Yeah, cool. All right, let's listen to a little bit of uh, Halo Effect. Yeah. such a great tune i i, I oh, yeah. after i picked my two i went back and i listened to halo effect i'm like oh that's that's so good you know oh and i listened to yours also and i was like damn those are good <laughs> i wish i could have picked those i know but it's like this rush is wonderful so we exactly. don't have to choose Ex exactly um well also, yeah, also sorry. as you were playing that yeah um it reminded me a little bit of nobody's hero that's also, right yeah the very dramatic and, very dramatic yeah and yeah. uh in the yeah in a way that uh they don't always do but that they're certainly capable of you know that's a good comparison um uh, well i chose the uh well the garden is up there for me and uh but uh that was i've already established that so i picked two new uh songs that i thought uh for me uh were the strongest uh out of uh, out of the whole album and the entire album is is very strong i think for me you know they they released um, a couple of tunes before the album came out, like 2010. I think Be to Be was one, and maybe Caravan was uh, yeah, another. Caravan was the other one. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, I I didn't like that they released singles. It kind of bummed me out because I a I wanted to hear more, and I didn't want to get if these were going to be on the next album, I didn't want to get sick of them. You know, I wanted to. Right. I wanted some fresh new stuff. Anyway, they. I like Be You To Be. I think it's a fabulous tune, but I had listened to it so much by the time yeah. uh, uh, Clockwork Angels come out. In a way, it was a teaser, which is cool, too. So uh, The Anarchist uh, was one and um, <clears throat> of my choices. And uh, uh, producer Nick uh, Raskulinitz uh, tells Music Radar why this boisterous rocker is one of his favorites. Uh, he says, to me, it's all about the riff. He's, uh, he says this, and uh, this riff takes me back to the old days. That was one of the cool things about working on this record, helping Rush to know that it was okay to be like this. You guys can do this, he says. You guys did it a long time ago. You could do it again. You own it. He says there's a lot of interplay happening between everybody on this song. He continues, there was a demo, but we added a keyboard and high strings. It morphed. Vocally, it was about getting 
about getting Getty up in that high register where he belongs. His energy level is pretty cool here. Let's listen to The Anarchist. I just love that riff and the bass is so ominous and heavy on this song. It's so fabulous. It's, it's really dominant. And it makes me wonder what Rush would sound like if they had treated Getty like a normal bass player and just like mixed him all the way down. Like so many other bands do. Uh, I mean, he's just pounding the shit out of that thing. I know. And I know. it's, just, it just is really dominant and it really pushes the whole song. Yeah. Um, you know, put to this test of choosing. Uh, I, you oh, know, go ahead. And I'm sure if he was lower in the mix, it would be it would be okay. But yeah, yeah, it's oh, amazing. no, it's a mix. But I'm glad he's not. So, yeah. yeah. Right, right, and just you know, when you listen to it with headphones, especially uh, like we are now, uh, it's just super strong. Um, well, yeah. I chose my other song was the title track. Um, my. Uh, if, if the, we're getting a little choppy here, but uh, my other song that I chose was the title track of the album Clockwork Angels at seven, uh, clocking in at seven, uh, third, seven minutes and 31 seconds. It's really an opus. Um, uh, it's just, if there's one song on this album that ties it all together for me, it's this song. It's so heavy. And I remember them playing it live. It's such a majestic album and you know when you think of the steampunk yeah. the steampunk theme in this this album i'm hearing a, i live by a train yard here in new hampshire and uh and how oh, fitting yeah. how fitting to have a train go by uh while listening to uh while listening to clockwork angels um so let's listen a little bit about the uh, listen uh, listen uh to a little bit of uh clockwork angels the title track here just a sampling of the tune but i just neil is like pounding the crap out of those drums yeah. in that little piece Seriously. there man. it's such a good song i wish i could play the entire thing well anyway on this song uh rascal and uh, continues and says that every track on clockwork clockwork angels was born out of getty born out of a getty lee and alex license jam quote getty and alex would sit in a room and jam with a click track or a simple drum beat he recalls the songs were very different without neil so that was the first stage of the demos the next demo stage was to get neil onto the songs uh Raskulinus says that songs constantly changed 
uh, continuing that half of the album was written between 2008 and 2010. The second half was written in two weeks in the studio while Neil and I were tracking drums on some of the finished songs. Getty and Alex were down the hall working on the other ones. According to Raskulenis, the first time Neil played to Clockwork Angels was when he sat down in the studio with his headphones on and went for it. It was amazing to watch it all happen. A lot of the drum parts on this album and especially the song Clockwork Angels, uh, he only played one time. There were multiple, there weren't multiple, multiple takes of these songs. Uh, licensed guitar solo you hear on the record is the original one he recorded for the demo. It's just him playing by himself without the other band members. And the same thing with, with Lifeson and what Raskulens is saying here on the song Clockwork Angels is the same thing he said about uh, the garden and that guitar solo that I love so much is that it just happened naturally. It was part of the demos and they, and they just kept it, which is really great. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, you know, and the fact that this, this was their final album, I often think that, that Snakes and Arrows was almost like a warm up session to Clockwork Angels. It got them lubricated and, uh, and uh, oiled up and they just let it rip on Clockwork Angels, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a, that's astonishing, by the way, uh, that some that like what we're hearing in that song is Neil playing for the first time. Incredible. Uh, that's I mean, when I when I'm not going to name names, uh, but when you think of drummers from certain uh, very popular metal bands uh, who spend six months in the studio with a click track just to get boom, I know. bap, boom, I know. bap. I, know. I don't get it at all. You know. Agree. But, well, um, here's some uh, Clockwork Angels facts and details. Uh, it's their 19th and final studio album, as we know. It reached number two on the Billboard 200. In doing so, Rush equaled American band leader Ray Conniff's record of achieving 12 to 10 albums without ever reaching number one. Wow. During the band's year and a half break following its Stakes and Arrows tour, the group decided to write a new studio album. The album was recorded in April 2010 at Blackbird Studio in Nashville, Tennessee, and from October to December 2011 at Revolution Recording in, in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Uh, two songs, as we mentioned, that would eventually appear on the album, car on the album were Caravan and Be You To Be. Uh, they were released as, to radio stations and made available as a digital download on, uh, in June of 2010, which I didn't love that. I didn't I remember not really loving that. Uh, Rush huh. putting out singles in that way is like, uh, I don't know. Well, um, I don't, I don't, but yeah, but they weren't doing it like in the same way yeah. that where like, you know, you would have to put out like this edited two minute yeah. little ditty yeah. for radio. You know, I took my take on it was just that they were like, okay, people listen to music differently now. Yeah. And they buy music differently now. Right. And uh, like, I don't know if, um, if you're a fan or not, but uh, Jethro Tull's Aqualung yep. uh, was Wrote reissued a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, but what they did when they reissued it, at least digitally, was separate each one of like those big pieces into like little five minute songs, yeah. uh, which a, a lot of people were completely enraged about. But Ian Anderson was like, this, this is how people buy music now. This is just what the market is. So I, my take was that they were just sort of coming from the same place. Well, considering that this ended up being a concept album uh, and they're releasing singles before it was officially a concept album, it's kind of interesting. Uh, the album debuted at number one in Canada and number two on the Billboard 200 chart. The album won the award for Rock Album of the Year at the 2013 Juno Awards. At the end of the band's Snakes and Arrows tour in July 2008, the group took a year and a half long break, during which Rush released the live albums uh, Snakes and Arrows Live and the compilation Working Men, uh, Working Men in 2009. Uh, then the band reconvened in Los Angeles in December 2009 to discuss what projects they wanted to undertake in the coming year. Among their options were to start a new studio, studio album and to go, undergo a major tour, as Neil Peart later wrote. Uh, quote, fools that we are, we ended up doing both. The, uh, the idea of an album with a backstory as opposed to a collection of different songs became an attractive one to the group for which Neil Peart detailed one set uh, in a fictional, fictional world with a suite of songs telling a story. Rush had worked on new material as early as February 2009, but Alex Lifeson denied a speculation 
that they were set to make a concept album at the time. So by 2009, there was no, there was talks, but it wasn't set in stone. Rush right. adopted the band's usual songwriting methods, which involved Getty Lee and Lyson working on music at their home studios in Toronto, while Peart worked alone from his California home on lyrics. The group had encouraged one another to become more spontaneous with their solos and live performance, uh, which became a primary element while writing new music for Clockwork Angels. Um, after some weeks into the writing, Peart had developed a, his story uh, further, leading to the band's agreement to adapt it into a concept album uh, while having each track make its own statement. Rush had previously recorded conceptual songs throughout the year, but had yet to commit to a full album concept. Lee was uh, apprehensive towards the idea at first, as he wanted the group to move forward uh, in direction and not adopt something typical of fellow progressive rock bands of the 1970s, which is funny to me because they were so good at it. You know? yeah. <laughs> um, in a change of pace, Piet wrote uh, the lyrics to Clockwork Angels on a blank canvas without using any preconceived ideas that he had written down. Early in July 2000, January 2010, Piet had written some ideas and sent them to Leah Lyson, who then paired the words to pieces of music that they had come up with. Peart was influenced to devise a story and lyrics set in a dystopian steampunk inspired world lit only by fire, named after the same title book on the history of the Middle Ages by William Manchester and driven by steam, intricate clockworks and alchemy. He had incorporated elements of ancient tradition with tarot cards and vapor trails, as we know, and uh, the ancient Hindi game of Leela on snakes and arrows and wanted to bring in alchemy for clockwork angels. Um, a couple more facts here. Uh, Clockwork Angels contains string arrangements composed of six violins and two cellos. Uh, Brad Maddox, who I hope to have on the show in the future, is a sound engineer, front of house sound engineer for Rush, stated that wor when working the strings into the album, he says, I'd worked, this, I'd worked with strings in the past, but it was always either in a very quiet setting with minimal sound reinforcement or the violins were strictly electric a Clockwork Angels tour, the band definitely meant for the strings to be featured and acoustic. So that was quite an amazing thing to watch. Yeah. Um, and a couple more here. So the album was influenced by Candide, a work by the French philosopher Voltaire that is a favorite of Neil's. Uh, there are parallels between the ca title character and Voltaire's work and Owen Hardy, who is the star of Clockwork Angels. Both lead a life of adventure and discovery, including uh, concluding that there is no grand plan to the universe and that we are in control of our destiny. So typical, Neil, yeah. to be writing in that way, right? Um, and uh, on February 9th, 2012, science fiction writer, novelist, Kevin J. Anderson, a longtime friend of Neil Peart, announced that he'd be writing a novelization of Clockwork Angels. He also revealed information about the album's concept in a young man's quest to follow his dreams, he is caught between the grandiose forces of order and chaos. He delivers, he travels across a lavish and colorful world of steampunk and alchemy with lost cities, pirates, anarchists, exotic carnivals, and a rigid watchmaker who imposes precision on every aspect of daily life. Released on September 4th, 2012, the novel was followed by a loose sequel titled Clockwork Lives, or Clockwork Lives, I can't figure out which, uh, which was published on, I'll have to ask Kevin, uh, uh, which was published yeah. on September 15th, 2015. And, um, you know, we're really glad to have Kevin on the show. Uh, again, he's published more than 165 books, 56, which have been national or international bestsellers. He's written numerous novels in the Star Wars, X-Files, and Dune universes as well as unique steampunk fantasy novels like Clockwork Angels and Clockwork Lives, uh, written with legendary rock drummer Neil Peart, of course, based on the concept album uh, uh, Clockwork Angels. His original works include Saga of Seven Suns series, the Terra Incognita Fantasy tri Trilogy. I, I'm, I'm sure some of our fans will know some of these. I haven't yeah, read them. For sure. Um, I the, know. Okay. Yeah. The Saga of Shadows trilogy and his numerous, his humorous horror series featuring Dan Shamble, Zombie P.I. He's edited numerous anthologies, written comics and games and lyrics to two rock CDs. Anderson and his wife, Rebecca Moesta, uh, Rebecca, Rebecca Moesta are the publishers of Wordfire Press. 
his most recent novels are Stocky and Kill Zone and Spine of the Dragon. And we can't thank Kevin enough to be on the show. Right. Welcome, Kevin J. Anderson, to Two Guys Talking Rush. Hey, Kevin. Hello there. Hey, how are you? I'm hey, doing Kevin. fine. I've got my, my Clockwork Lives t-shirt on. I had a million Rush shirts to choose from, but I picked one that I figured most people wouldn't necessarily know about. So. Well, I'm glad what, you did. You, I'm glad you. I'm glad you spelled that out. So it's clock, Clockwork well, Lives, not Clockwork right. Lives. Yes. Okay. Right. Hold on a <laughs> okay. Wanted to get the cat toy out of the way so that people don't go. What's that great, strange? Uh, it did. Thing? It did yeah. create a focal point. I have to say. Yes. Well, <laughs> what, wait, what wait you the cats themselves show up and they they go ahead and do it so <laughs> what you what you need for what you need for this is one of these like stupid backgrounds that i have that completely obscures whatever the situation is in your house if i took <laughs> this away it, everyone would be horrified at what's behind <laughs> me because uh, you know the, it, the maid didn't come this week let's say um, well i could always do something like that oh i like that hey, or, or we can do cloud city, cloud city oh wow it. oh wow Oh my God! But this one's more appropriate. I like, so. I like that yeah, one the best. That one, yeah, me too. Yeah. But um, you know, the thing yeah. is, is that those those get distracting, and what I'm gonna wanna wanna do is to go. And here's this book I'm talking about, and it's yeah. gonna, yeah. you know, fizzle all over the place. So we'll just yeah. we'll do Kevin under normal circumstances here instead. Well, well, Kevin, uh, welcome to two guys talking cats. That's yes. exactly what it is because Neil was a huge cat fan. Was he really? No, oh, oh, okay. Absolutely not. That was that was one of our. I, I remember the, the very first time Neil he spent the night on my couch, and the next morning he was like, "Oh, I got a play tonight, and I'm all sleepy because that cat kept me up all night long, oh, scratching yeah. on the couch." And no, he was mm. he was a dog a dog person, so. Awesome. Well, Kevin, uh, thank you very much for uh, joining the show. And uh, we've, been, you know, be, we've given you a proper introduction uh, prior to you coming into, uh, oh, okay. uh, into the, uh, um, uh, the forum here. Um, and because of you, uh, Dan and I got into a very heated discussion about Star Wars and the Star Wars, yes. <laughs> back, back into the saddle with the Star Wars thing and George Lucas. Well, I, didn't, and, I didn't write the last one, so don't blame me for anything. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, I'm just looking at you. You've had such a prolific career in writing. And I, I've written two books. Dan has written five, uh, but nowhere near uh, to your uh, your level. Um, but I want to... <laughs> no. but, well, that's why you have to make so much money by writing a podcast and i don't have to do that so. <laughs> yeah right wow. okay. um you know looking at uh, your, a little bit of your bio which i did do um you have a physics uh an astronomy degree from the university of wisconsin madison you've worked 13 years as a technical writer for the lawrence livermore national La laboratory before becoming a full-time novelist you are the you are a board member of the challenger centers for space science education and the Lifeboat Foundation. You've climbed mountains, including all 54 peaks over 14,000 feet in Colorado. You've completed uh, all 500 miles of the Colorado Trail, and you've, vid you've visited six of the seven continents, only Antar Antarctica well, left. Not, not lately with COVID. But, oh, uh, right, of course. Um, and you and your wife have been married for more than 20 years. You live in a castle in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. Well, that's that's a start. In fact, we just last week had our 29th wedding anniversary, so hey. that's that's where we're at. Wow! Congratulations! And, uh, and uh, since I've I've also gone back to at, at the age of 56, I think I went back to college and got an MFA for myself because I'm I am now the director and I'm a professor at uh, teaching grad students in publishing at Western Colorado University. So I'm I'm a I'm in fact, I, I wrote Neil and I said, we're both the professor now. So, <laughs> I love it. Uh, well, so I got that. well the, you know, the reason why I read all that is because uh, one question I, I, I have for you uh, in your body of work, have all these adventures uh, and all this knowledge, how has all this contributed to your writing? Well, you know, one of the things when I, I always wanted to be a writer. I mean, from five years old is when I said, I want to be a writer. 
And so I, you know, read voraciously and I, I took you know, writing classes and things. And then when I went to college, um, my parents, my, my dad was a bank president, my mom was an accountant, and they were very practical types and didn't quite know what to do with uh, what? Kevin wants to be a writer? Well, nobody can make a living as a writer. So I kind of had to promise them that I would not major in creative writing in college, that if I was going to go to college, I had to uh, major in something that I could get a job. And so I promised them not to major in English. And instead, I majored in astronomy with a minor in Russian history. Just, you know, I followed my word. Um, but one of the things that I, and I took some creative writing classes and fiction writing workshops and things. And one of the things that I, I learned, I, I like, I'm a, I'm a big cook. I like to be um, a, a chef at home. I cook all of our meals. And the cooking metaphor that I like to use is that if, if you want to be a writer, if all you get is an English degree, it's like buying a bunch of cookbooks with no ingredients. And if you want to cook a bunch of great things, I think you need to have a pantry stuffed with ingredients. And the more experiences you have, the more things you learn, the more places you go, the more cultures you're exposed to, all of that is like your spice cabinet. It's your, it's your pantry, it's your meat locker, it's everything that you have to draw from. And just studying English will teach you how to write, but it won't give you anything to write about. And I think a beautifully written book that's about nothing is inferior to an adequate book that's got full of cool ideas and great stories and great characters in it. Yes, um, study, studying English will give you very good grammar. You will be able to conjugate the hell out of any verb you want. Uh, but yeah, but it, it, the creative side of it, you, I feel like that's wiring. I feel like you're kind of born with that. Uh, I don't think you can teach someone to be creative. You can encourage them and you can, you know, show them ways to kind of like raise their game a little bit or something like that. But I, I just, I, I know people where it's like, they just don't, they don't have a creative bone in their body. You know, yeah. that's fine. They, they're they inclined in other directions, but you, you have it or you don't, I feel like. Right. And, and the, you know, it's, it's the cliched question where people come up and they'll ask a writer, well, where do you get your ideas? And I've, I've, honestly never understood that question. It's like, how do the rest of you stop them from coming? And it, it's a way, I think it's a way your brain is wired. I mean, I'll look at something and go, oh, that's cool, but what if this happens? Or what if that right. happens? Or, and there are people who are, you know, the, and I mean nothing derogatory, like the, like the best auto mechanics or the, or the best politicians are, well, maybe I shouldn't throw that in there, but the, but like the best anything, they don't need to ask questions and make up stories. That's what I'm doing. Right. But it just has always baffled me with people like the, it, it's genuinely stumps them. Where do you get your ideas? And, you know, I, I used to have like these spiral notebooks where I would write down my story ideas when I would get them. And after filling up like 12 of them with stories and novels, I'll never, ever live long enough to write. I just went, nah, the, the good ones will just keep coming back. And, yeah. And yeah, well, Stephen, you, you know, Stephen King yeah. said that, that that was the most hated question that he ever gets is where do you get your ideas? And he, and he said that now his stock answer to that is Utica. So anytime anyone says to him, you know, Stephen King, where do you get your ideas? It's like Utica. I get them from Utica. So he hates it. He hates Harlan, it too. Harlan Ellison used to say, well, don't you know that if you're a member of the Science Fiction Writers of America, it's a subscription service and they mail you a new idea every month. And that's, <laughs> yeah, um, that's amazing. And people believed him. So it's, a, yeah. It, well, and, and you I've can't, got to, you can't I've expect got to people off. who don't write though. Sorry. Uh, right. Go ahead. I, I was going to bounce off of that and, and kind of pull us back to rush here because one of my, real inspirations has always been music. And I would listen to all my prog rock albums and I would just, you know, listen to the full, the, the Necromancer and go, oh, I want to write that as a story or the Fountain of Lamneth. And, yeah. and I was a big uh, Kansas fan and Styx fan and yeah. Alan Parsons and, sure. and all this. I mean, these are all science fiction music and you, you yeah. listen to 
guys. Two guys are talking. Brush two. Two guys. Two guys are talking. Brush two. Two guys are talking. Brush two. Two guys are talking. Brush two. Two guys are talking. Brush 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 two guys. Talking Rush Podcast next week. That's not nice. Live music inspires millions around the world, but the concerts we all enjoy wouldn't be possible without the countless crew members working behind the scenes. As COVID-19 puts concerts on pause, We want to extend a helping hand to the touring and venue crews who depend on shows to make a living. Crew Nation was created to do just that. Crew members are the backbone of the live music industry, and we hope you'll join us in supporting them through this temporary intermission until we can once again unite millions around the world through the power of live music. Crew Nation is powered by Music Forward Foundation, a charitable 501c3 organization that will be administering the fund. Live Nation has committed $10 million to Crew Nation, contributing an initial $5 million to the fund, then matching the next $5 million given by artists, fans, and employees dollar for dollar. Please support Crew Nation at www.livenationentertainment.com slash crewnation.